Lucy. Good to see you. I think we can start. Or we wait for another five minutes for people to join us. What do you think? I think we can start right now. Just on five. Okay. Can we start? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi, Dr. Joy. Uh, Hi, Dr. Joy. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Joy, Dr. Joy E.A. Benson. I welcome you all to today's meeting. I'm a public health expert of, uh, with the um, Pink Africa Foundation in Kosovo State, Nigeria, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, I welcome you all to today's meeting on Orange in the Pink Space and ways of how we can end gender-based violence. Um, we know that violence against women and girls, especially those plagued with cancer, is topical now. And um, according to the United Nations, it's been estimated that one in three women experience either physical or sexual intimate partner violence or even non-partner violence in their lifetime. So it's imperative we discuss this today. And we also know that violence is a violation of human rights and a form of discrimination that undermines the dignity and integrity of persons who experience it. So today we have Dr. Ani and Chewi Ani. We have speakers, three speakers, who will be talking to us on Orange in the Pink Space. We have Dr. Ani with us. She's um, the president of Pink Africa Foundation. She is a creative, innovative, and performance driven woman with a strong capacity to manage multiple projects on strict deadlines. She extrudes. Sorry. Okay. Are we there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. She extrudes utmost dedication for humanitarian services and has invested more than 16 years of versatile experience in rural healthcare. She has successfully carried out more than 40 outreaches within the last five years in Kosovo State and neighboring states in Nigeria, strengthening the healthcare service delivery. And as a result, providing free healthcare for thousands of women children and men in Nigeria. She's a regular TV and radio speaker on women, men and children related issues, especially on health, empowerment and empowerment rights of women and children. She is or she was a former president of the Medical Women Association of Nigeria, Kosovo State Chapter, an immediate past vice chairman of the Nigerian Medical Association, Kosovo State Branch, and currently the president of Pink Africa Foundation. We welcome you, Dr. Ani. Thank you very much. Can you say hello to everyone? Welcome you, Dr. Ani, to today's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Joy. I think I appreciate I everyone. I can hear you. Hello. Okay. We also have 
the president and um, um, the president of the um, Tainian Pink Mulan Foundation, and the person of King Wen Tao. Hi. She's the founder and president. Yeah, she's the founder and president of Tainian Pink Mulan Association, the former president of the Tainian Phoenix Club of Zonta International Club D31. She's a former president of the Union Club of Lions International 300 D1 and the director of the Italian Shu Jiao Share Association. She has been an event speaker, organizer, and moderator of the NGOC.TSW6364, 65, and 66 sessions. We welcome you, Ms. Ching Wen Tao. Hi, hi. Hi, thank hi. you, everyone. We also have in our midst, we also have in our midst, um, we also have in our midst, um, Daisy, who will be performing for us um, and should also make a presentation. Um, Daisy is a seventh grade student in Talented Music Program. She'll be performing for us today. And the Talented Music Program of the Tanya Municipal Cheng Junior High School in Taiwan. She majors in cello and minors in piano. Uh, and, um, she's had more than three years of office performance SW65. Welcome you, Daisy Chow, to today's meeting. So we'll take our first presentation today by Dr. Dr. Ani. We'll take our first presentation. The presentation today will be, um, her presentation will be an orange in the pink stick. So Dr. Ani, you have the floor to make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, good morning, wherever you are. And good night for those in Taiwan. But don't sleep yet. We want to discuss orange in the pink space. And there, hear your own contributions. And thereafter, you can have a pleasant night. I welcome you all to this a presentation hosted by Pink Mulan, Taiwan, and co-hosted by Pink Africa Foundation. We appreciate everybody who has taken out time to join us. My name is Nchewe Lemiani. I'm president and founder of Pink Africa Foundation. Next slide. The the, so this topic was engineered by our experiences in the field when we deal with our cancer patients. We found out that we've had cases of violence amongst women who have experienced one or more forms of cancer, especially breast cancer. Um, violence against women is not just a social perversive problem. It is a silent kill. It's a silent cancer in its own, in its own right. So what is a cancer? A cancer is when any body part begins to malfunction. Either the body part goes out of proportion a difference, it, has a, it takes up a different size, different shape, a different color, and loses its primary function. Then we say that organ is cancerous. So we are saying gender-based violence is a silent cancer in its own. It has claws and slowly devours the victim. These women who have this silent cancer, they cannot share their stories. They are free to tell another person that they're experiencing violence and miss the torture of having to, you know, go through the pains and the ordeal of any form of cancer. They, are, they, they, they tend to originate stories, you know, I don't want to call them lies, they originate stories to shield themselves from more pain. How do you tell someone that because you, are, you have breast cancer, 
your husband has decided to marry another wife, how do you tell someone that because you have cervical cancer, your husband decided to pick the third wife? How do you tell someone that it's because you have breast cancer that your 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 children, you know, have decided to abandon the house, they live together with you and take up another apartment because they don't they do not want to go through the torture that you're going through. So they give they, they tell stories to cover up what is really happening to them at the moment. To, to cover up in attempt to cover up the pain, shield themselves from pain and shame. How do you tell stories that you know in the midst of suffering from cancer? You know, you were physically abused and you came out with a black eye. You end up saying, oh, I fell in the bathroom. And you're, you're going through chemotherapy, you fell in the bathroom and there was nobody to help. And so you have to assess medical treatment. So that is the cancer encased in cancer in its own. That is for us what we talk, what we are here to talk about. And sometimes these women do not have the ability to tell the story to another person because they die in the hands of the abusers. They eventually die. So the story is not told. That is why violence amongst cancer patients is for me the most dangerous type of violence in existence. Next slide. Breast cancer, for example, 90% of, I'm talking about my region, Africa, Nigeria, to be precise, 70 to 90% of the women that present themselves show up in the hospital in the late stages of the disease, stages three and stages four. By this time, there's not much you can do for the patients. This cancer is, has either taken up a large part of the organ or has metastasized to another part of it that spread to other regions in the body. So when they come to the hospital in these late stages, there's not much you can do for them. And where do they present themselves next? Because first of all, disease condition in most regions, especially in third world countries, is shrouded in the loss of superstitious belief. They say it's because you've offended the gods, or God is not happy with you, or you have uh, somebody is after your life, a relative is after, after your life, a mother-in-law is after your father-in-law, or in, um, friends or where you walk, people are not happy with you. That's why some diseases come to you. And then they seek alternatives to mitigate the problem. So if you offended the gods, the next thing to do is to attempt to appease the gods. And when you have appeased the gods several times and you're not having, uh, getting better, you now decide to come to the hospital or they give you some herbal concoctions that have no scientific basis for treatment. And by the time the woman eventually presents in the hospital, it is too late. And for those who actually know that cancer is a disease condition, you know, and should be treated in the hospital, 70% of them do not have the means or the funds to take care of themselves or to assess health care. And so we have late presentation. These reasons constitute the 70 to 90% of late presentations of cancers in developing countries. Next slide, please. So what's the burden? Um, it was it, it, WHO, according to WHO, it says that uh, it accounts for cancer accounts for one in six deaths worldwide. This is for 2020 statistics, and and that breast cancer in its own, you know, we have 2.26 million new cases for 2020. There are no current statistics for 2021 at the moment. Now I'm typifying breast cancer because that's the color of the day. Now, 99% of people who have breast cancer or individuals are women. Only 1% of breast cancer is found in males. And when you find that 1%, there is 99% chance that it will be malignant. However, women bear the brunt of the disease. And that's why we're talking about them. Next slide, please. Orange in the pink space. I'm sure you wondered why we chose this topic pink in the orange space, sorry. We're here to talk about violence amongst women. Orange is the color, you know, for us to talk about gender-based violence. We're here to talk about violence amongst women who are suffering from any form of cancer. And we choose, we chose pink because pink represents the breast cancer awareness color, which is usually, you know, done in the month of October. When the, the malfunctioning of anyone's body part 
and the malfunctioning of the people and the social system around them equates to double jeopardy by all standards. This is what I think. This is what my, my own impression currently. The woman has cancer and she also has another silent cancer, which is gender-based violence. So it's double trouble for her on all fronts. Now, violence against women is a major public health problem, and it's, it is a violation of the woman's human right. Violence against women encompassing all forms of violence that result in physical, emotional, sexual, financial suffering of the woman. And you can imagine if this happens when the woman has to deal with losing the function of one of her body parts, there's not much hope for that woman. Next slide, please. Globally, we are told, according to WHO, that one in three women have been subjected to physical, sexual, and intimate partner or non-partner sexual violence. There are no known global statistics for violence against women who are suffering from cancer or who have suffered from any form of cancer. There are no known statistics, global statistics. Now, violence in its own negatively affects every aspect of a woman's health. Any form of violence in the form of cancer is a disaster because what it does to the woman is that it slows down the process of healing and reduces the chances of survival. It is said that if a woman has cancer, she has psychological supports. She heals faster than one who lacks psychological supports, family supports, healthcare supports. So that's why we're here. Gender-based violence undermines the health and reminds the security, the dignity, and the autonomy of its victims. Next slide, please. Now, what happened to us in the last 18 months? We had orange in the pink space, and we also had the dark red, and this orange and pink. I use the dark red to typify the COVID-19 pandemic. Gender-based violence escalated during the COVID pandemic. The heat of the COVID pandemic in the first six months when the pandemic started and the world was lost about where to go, what to do, how to deal with it, the cancer, cancer patients were the worst hit. I tell you what happened. The women were seen all as a burden to their families or their caregivers because they were lost at what to do. You have a cancer patient. You cannot take the patient to the hospital because cancer is termed at that point, not an emergency or at that point, not effective, or at that point, the person who has cancer may be a carrier of COVID. At that point, healthcare, you know, was not, you know, regulated to some extent. So the patient has COVID, you are a caregiver. You cannot, just by the fact that you have funds to support cost of treatment, you cannot assess treatment for the patient. The patient's condition worsens every day because cancer in its own grows, it doesn't just stop growth, it grows every day. Every time that you do not do something, take a drug, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy to halt the disease progression, you leave the patient like that, the disease worsens. So most families were frustrated. And the fact that gender-based violence, you know, issued in such families where things, and maybe they didn't know how to handle it. There was no, there are no avenues for psychological support. We don't have, you know, uh, we don't have ready to go online call centers that you could call to get help in our region. There's none in existence. Maybe in the central part of Nigeria, there may be some online supports that we can actually call for support. So one of my patients describes this period as suffocating. Says, doctor, I was suffocated. And she also says this period was deeply traumatizing for herself and for the family. She said to me at some point that she was abandoned in her room. They fed her at specific times of the day. She had one or two, one of her kids, you know, would always come around and say, mommy, we love you, but there's not much we can do for you. Some didn't even bother to come because they couldn't stand the pain, you know, the fact that she's in pain and they cannot do anything about it. So they abandoned her in the room. And she says in quotes, they waited for me to die. Amazingly. I suffered the heat of the COVID, but I survived. However, 
my chances of survival are slim as the doctor now says the cancer has spread. Of course, we know that regular hospital, you know, visits commence about the fourth or the fifth month after the heat of the pandemic. And, you know, there are some breast cancers or cancers that do not give you time. Once it's established and it just begins, begins to progress, by three, four months, you already hit the stage four of the disease. Then, as a result of the pandemic, COVID, it, and the cancer itself was said, said to be not an emergency. Hospitals closed their doors, appointments were rescheduled and rescheduled and rescheduled for months and months over. The women missed their chemotherapy sessions. The missed their psycho psychological support sessions, the missed surgical appointments, and the counseling sessions. Many women died. That is the truth. We lost two patients during the COVID-19. I just remembered after I'd done this slide. The first patient we had start to support for um, part support for surgery, no, for chemotherapy. We got drugs from the company paid for the drugs. She took the first course. By then she was to go for the second course, COVID stroke. The woman has to come like four hours away from the village to come and assess care. She came and the doors of the hospitals were locked. I tried to use my position and my power to try and see if something could be done. The, the only doctor who accepted to see her privately gave me a price that I couldn't afford. I couldn't afford to pay for that healthcare service. I said to her, we will try our best, you know, and keep looking. Three weeks later, the kids, the children called me. Her eldest child is 12 years old. This woman was abandoned by her husband the very day it was diagnosed she had breast cancer. She had been battling the disease for 13 months. She died by the 14th month. By this time, husband was nowhere to be found. Children abandoned. She moved in with her sisters. The sister stayed after a while. I heard in the last three weeks, it was just her and the children abandoned by everybody because of, you know, the, 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 I, would, I would use what the first patient said, the suffocating, you know, uh, uh, frustrating um, conditions that prevailed during the pandemic. The second patient was before our 2020 Calabar Go Pink Day. She had agreed to be our face for the campaign. She came in eight hours away from the village. The village people and the church, the Catholic church, had put together funds for her to go through the first stage of um, the, uh, to go through the first stage of chemotherapy. Now she needed money for surgery. We had agreed to sponsor surgery. We spoke with the management of the University of Calvary Teaching Hospital. They accepted. The day she was coming for the surgery, COVID struck. So this one, in, 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 it didn't even take two weeks. I really don't know how it happened like that because she was in stage three. But in two weeks, we were called and they said she collapsed and she didn't make it out of, you know, you know, uh, after resuscitation, couldn't resuscitate her. And that was the end. This particular woman had been abandoned by husband brothers it was a, 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 a nephew that was looking after her and her children so the effect of uh, the gender-based violence in its own they may not they, the cancer patients will not really experience you know physical abuse but what they really experience is a financial abuse and the emotional abuse next slide please Like I talked about the forms of violence, physical bodily harm, you know, maybe uh, turning the, patient, the woman to a punch bag, sexual, sexual abuse of any form, emotional abuse, psychological violence, any act or omission that causes mental suffering for, for the woman, economic or financial abuse, this stops the chart. A situation where a family that is not so buoyant decides to sacrifice the health of a woman who has cancer for the survival needs of the family. Take for example, we had a, pa we had a patient who, she has seven sons, seven boys. Out of the seven boys, two have graduated. Only the two who are graduated are currently working. The remaining five boys are still in school, you know? The family has to sell properties. The 
went through the first course of chemotherapy, they sold properties to enable Hago. They went through the second course, they sold another, they just have one property left. And they say, we cannot sell everything because of you. Doctor says you are in stage three, stage four, you will soon die. Please, mommy, we need to send these ones to school. Don't be upset. But this is what happened, real life. And so cancer treatment was put on hold for her so that the other five children can go to school. It may not see it as, we may not see it as, you know, a form of violence, but it is. It is, sadly enough, and it's the reality of what many families are going through because they have to do out-of-pocket expenditure to take care of the patient who has cancer. Not many health insurance schemes take care of cancer, cancer treatment. They don't. They follow you up to an extent when the treatment plant exceeds a particular amount of money, they tell you you're on your own. So families have to bear the brunt. But how do you bear the brunt of cancer care and get bonds and not hurt the person who has cancer? It's a dilemma. I don't know how we go about it. Next slide. So for the past 30 years, we've had 16 days activity, activism against, uh, of gender-based violence, against gender-based violence going on around the world, November up to December, every year for the last 16 years. What I noticed and Pink Mulan noticed, and Taiwan Pink Mulan, what we noticed was that when they talk about violence against women and girls, they often overlook violence amongst cancer patients. That's what gave rise to this topic. And we decided to bring it to, you know, to lamb light. It's a narrow space often overlooked in the 60 days activism campaign as more emphasis is made on physical, emotional, verbal, or a combination of all forms of violence in apparently healthy women. These women do not have cancer. So imagine if someone has cancer, and now has to experience the scourge and the effect of gender-based violence. Life is hopeless for that woman, except the woman is strong-willed and determined to go through this wilderness uh, period or this trying period. Next slide, please. In 2021, um, we realized that the 16 days activi activism focused mainly on femicide and gender-related killings, which, you know, hit the roof during the pandemic. Today, we have come together as Pink Mulan, Taiwan Pink Mulan and Pink African, we're putting forward these questions to the wall. We are saying, how many women diagnosed with breast cancer have been, or any form of cancer, have been fast-tracked to the dark corridors of death because they have to deal with the disease, they have to deal with cancer, alongside with emotional, and physical violence and economic violence from friends and family and caregivers who are supposedly meant to show love and empathy. How many? I have a cancer patient, 39 years old. She's actually a survivor. We've been survived for the past three, maybe four, four years now. She's been in remission. I know, lost her job. The moment she told the boss that she had cancer, Lost, she used to work in the bank, lost her job. She was engaged to one of, you know, the engagement ceased. She had to sell her properties, car, everything to go through, you know, the sessions of treatment. But today she's a survivor. She has stories to tell. Next slide, please. There was a death on daughter with regards to interpersonal violence suffered by cancer patients. The patient thinks they are meant to normalize emotional violence. They think that they are causing enough pain already, you know, by incapacitating, incapacitating the funds of the family or using up the funds of the family. So if they've experienced any form of emotional violence, they tend to suppress and ignore it. This is, this is what we have found out from our investigations on the field. They tend to suppress and ignore it they normalize emotional violence. It is normal thing for cancer patients. They just ignore it for most of them. The treatment is incomparable. They tell you, whatever they're doing to me, is it worse than the cancer that I have? But they forget 
that if you are treated right, you have an emotionally stable environment, you heal faster. Where there is a possibility for you to recover, you recover faster. The treatment, they say, is incomparable to the burden of the disease. And speaking out is a taboo in most climes. Hence, we have this deafening, you know, culture of deafening silence. Deafening silence and miss a silent cancer existing in one who is already experiencing one or one form of cancer. So for me, it's a double jeopardy. Our question number two, how many women and girls diagnosed with cancer have been abandoned to fate because of out-of-pocket expenditure for treatment of cancer? Because this will hamper progress of some activity in the family, maybe education of children, upkeep of one family member over the other. And so economic violence sprouts and the woman is denied the right to life. We cannot continue spending family money on these disease. So we wait for you to die. That is right, right to life denied, sadly. Intimate partner abuse has been reported in about 35% of women diagnosed with cancer. This was a sub report of one particular country with majority abandoned to fate. These brave women who eventually survived the mayhem called cancer sandwiched with partner violence. They stand, stand tall as living legends. 60% of cancer survivors have no spouse. They are alone. Okay? Separated. You can check in your region and find out if you have more than that percentage. But that is from the little study we have. 60% of our cancer patients. We, 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 during the course of this reading our post mastectomy bras, we had a few questions. We asked some of those women, are you married? 60% separated. Not legally. Some of them legally separated. Others, you know, divorced. Others separated. That is what we see. Next slide, please. How many women, we asked our last question, how many women diagnosed with cancer have to deal with workplace violence? How many have lost their jobs once the, the news of their disease becomes public? And uh, even though they are still not yet incapacitated, for instance, diagnosis of you know, cervical cancer in stage one, that the woman, if she has access to a cryotherapy machine, will be burnt off and she can go back to work and mistakenly gets into the news of the, the, uh, the, the head of personnel. Sorry, we have learned from Kiniko Kiniko, oh, sorry, I have used Nigerian now, that you can no longer work with us, hence your appointment as this, this, this terminated. Many women have these stories to tell. And I think this particular one is not just in the African continent. If we have people who are willing to share their stories, they will tell you it happens across the world. Next slide. These women have to do with the burden of social isolation. They lose their means of livelihood, as well as they have to deal with the burden of the disease. The uncertainties and the feeling of hopelessness, in addition to the absence of healthcare insurance for women, especially with regards to cancer-related diseases, are across many parastatals. This particular one plagues the globe. Hence, we need to speak out against workplace violence, especially amongst women who have been diagnosed with cancer. Workplace violence sadly escalated during the lockdown for many reasons, comfortably, you know, ascribed to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic was an excuse for many women to be laid off, especially those who were sick or had one or two, any form of cancer. Violence in the workplace remains a palpable means. And it's not exclusive to cancer patients. This one, it involves all the women around the world. Next slide. During the pandemic, we took our time to, you know, um, participate or, take, uh, or carry out uh, cancer awareness, screening and treatment for the first two stages of breast and cervical cancer in the rural spaces. We took the first one to GEP, and uh, UGEP is the largest local government in West Africa. We took the next one, next slide, we took the next one to Mpani, and 
I think in the first local government, we found five women who had cervical cancer in their stages one, and we bonded it up with support from um, FHI 360 that gave us the chirotherapy mission. So when you burn off that first stage of the disease, you find the woman 10 to 15 years of life. And next slide, please. This was Mpani, you know, we tried our best to follow the COVID-19 protocol, not so easy in the rural spaces. We provided face shields and face masks, not so easy in the rural spaces. Um, but we provided healthcare services for these women. Next slide, please. So what do we have to say to the world? We'll say we will continue as Pink Africa Foundation to advocate for women's and girls' rights. As we besiege a world without violence, we will stand against all forms of violence against women and girls who have been diagnosed with any form of cancer. And uh, next slide. In summary, I will say as a person, as a pink lady, that normalizing any form of violence amongst cancer patients is catastrophic. Whether it's financial violence, whether it's emotional violence, which is the most common, or physical violence, which is not so common amongst cancer patients, but it's present. We cannot afford to normalize it. We encourage the women to speak out and seek for help, seek for sight, seek for the help of a counselor, if you have one in your region. And then we're saying to everybody, help us end gender-based violence amongst cancer patients. Give them the support that they need wherever you find them. Help speed up their road to recovery, help speed up their road to remission, and improve their chances of survival. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you very much. Um, what can we do before we go to address orange in the pink space? It behoves all of us. Not one person can do the job. Not one NGO can do the job. Everybody is um, the responsibility of everybody. The floors will open and we welcome inputs from everyone during our question and answer sessions. We, we had one or two survivors who had agreed to speak up, you know, tell us about their experience. But because of perceived violence after they have come to speak up, they have declined. Well, we have a few videos, I think we have one from Taiwan, and we have one pre-recorded, which we will show in the course of the meeting. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And um, uh, please, if you have any questions, drop in the, in the chat box. For us to, you know, reduce uh, uh, the issues of body shaming, Pink Africa Foundation, you know, in the last two years have been involved in the production of um, locally produced post mastectomy bras. It takes $150 to $300 to get to buy one post mastectomy bra. But we have been able to raise support from uh, friends and families and companies in the region to produce post mastectomy bras. They are modified with locally available material. It helps to boost the woman's confidence and um, you know, reduces body shaming, which is very common amongst the uh, women who have lost their breasts. And we call on you to partner with us if you're, if you're led. Next slide. I don't think I have any other slide. This is our post mastectomy support. We have programmed ourselves to give out post mastectomy support to 20 hospitals in Nigeria in 2022. We have done so for two hospitals already. We have two more hospitals to go. Each hospital is entitled to 20 post mastectomy bras. If they exhaust their supplies before the end of 2022, we will do a replacement as God helps us. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I think Joy is muted and she doesn't know she's muted. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Ani, for your beautiful presentation on orange in the pink space and the impact of your foundation in trying to support patients with cancer who have experienced both one form of violence or the other. Would entertain questions and answers after the um, after the entire presentation. For now, we would um, invite King Wen Tao, the president of Tainan Pink Mulan Foundation, to present. Hi, thank you for you having me today. I'm Chen Wen Kao, the founder of Tainan Pink Mulan Association. Today, I'm going to share uh, the situation regarding uh, Taiwanese uh, violence against women in the marriage uh, in the marriage relationship. Next slide. Uh, according to um, the Focus Taiwan News report last year, just an update news, uh, our domestic violence is a growing trend in Taiwan. Let me pre. Uh, let me just briefly talk about uh, the reported data uh, from 2016 to 2020. The number of domestic violence cases reported to police in Taiwan increased steadily from 66,000 to 88,000, which was released uh, December 1st by the Academy for the Judicial Area following the study of veteran crime trends and victim protection service in our country. Citing an analysis by the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the report said uh, uh, in particular, a large number of children and elderly people had become targets of domestic violence over the past decade. While a proportion of female victims in all sex-related crimes in Taiwan had dropped by 25% on the average over the past 10 years, the downward trend was reversed last year. The number of female victims of sexual violence defined as those subject to sexual misconduct and offenses against minority increased in 2020 by annual 24.2%. Next slide, please. Um, our Ministry of Health and Welfare said one in five women in Taiwan have been subject to physical or mental abuse at some stage in their life, as indicated by its recent survey on intimate partner violence. The survey found that 90.62% of women aged 18 to 74 in Taiwan have been subjected to abuse by an intimate partner with the most common form as the following four. Like first being emotional abuse, probably as 60.76%. Uh, physical violence is 9.97%. Financial exploitation is 7.2%. And sexual abuse is 4.85%. Last one is stalking and harassment is around four and four point eight percent. Oh, next slide. So uh, uh, we will provide a real case of Taiwanese women against violence in the marriage stage. We will play a nominous recording for a later from Angelica, who is a survive, uh, who is a sex cancer survivor, went through domestic violence in her marriage. Life is not perfect. Life is beautiful. Thank you. I had cancer. I don't feel quite shocked. On the other hand, I was hoping my life will be shortened and ending my suffering. To ask it for all my parents in law and my husband, perhaps. 
My mother-in-law and my husband sent me up and left me and my kid alone living with my parents-in-law. He worked in another country instead of living with us. He only visited us only once for 10 days in every three months. It was a total different story when he asked me to quit my job and be the housewife taking of our kid and his parents living all together. My husband is from a very traditional family. Basically, you can only obey what they tell what to do and not to do without any second opinions. They send me rules like I need to show myself up punctually in the kitchen almost every day without any excuses. Cannot be alone with another man. There were two accidents hurt me the most. One was I was sent to emergency and in surgery fought for my life. My parents called my mother-in-law asking her to contact my um, husband as soon as possible, but he's not in Taiwan. But my mother-in-law didn't make the call in that critical moment. Instead, my husband heard my bad news from another person at that time. The other one was about my dad had eye surgery. Days of my dad's surgery and my husband's vacation were overlapped. I chose to visit my dad and kept him complain during the surgery and spent two days also with my husband when he was back from his break. The day he returned to work, my mother-in-law told me that instead of visiting my dad, I should stay put and keep my husband company. In the future, I will be blamed if my husband had affairs because I didn't take care of my husband well. No matter how hard I try to meet their expectations, it's never enough. For a few times, I asked help from my husband and all I heard from him was, I need to have Chinese parental respect, be a good daughter-in-law, and ignore their verbally abuse. There were times I broke down crying in the street in front of him, and the situation remained the same. Although those years I feel so long, still tried so hard to do so the best I could, hoping that someday they will appreciate what I done for them and contribute to the family. I didn't know I had suffered from depression. Even the doctor knows I had cancer. I still work like a machine trying to please them, even they show no mercy at all. Unfortunately, two years ago, my kid found out my husband had affairs. I broke down into tears and couldn't believe this was happening to me and to my kid, especially my kid. After a week of struggling, I decided to move out and my kids didn't want to stay with dad and grandparents. I know my kid feels so hard inside no less than me. I had asked her for help and found my kid a child psychiatrist for the therapy. My psychiatrist suggests I also need psychiatrist session to it was not only helpful for to the kids but also do me good. At first I was relaxed to do so because of close minded me and money type matter. But I'm willing to do anything, even sacrifice myself just to make my kids healthier and happier. So I followed her professional suggestions. It turns out that this was the best decision I had ever met after living with my parents in law for the last 10 years. It was so heartbreaking and always endless tears in the sessions during the therapy. It was like peeling onions one by one. Before living with my parents in law, I was a brave person and was full of patience for life. At some point after living with them, the patient was gone silently. My characteristics had become so twisted in order to survive in that family and force myself into the mood without knowing. 
during a particular session i brought into tears again and said i miss all the old me finally i realized all these years reluctantly trying was because deep inside i eagerly want my own home and keep my marriage safe after a few psychiatry sessions i gradually found myself back I like doing puzzles piece by piece. It's like that I got a second chance of living. You got to love yourself. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Be brave and be yourself. You got to love yourself in order to be a stronger individual. The stronger you are, the bigger chance for a change. I know it's plain for the worst scenario, so you won't get lost, hopeless if it happens. I would like to encourage all of you. Life is not easy as a cancer survivor, working full time and a single parent in my 50. I was so happy to see my kid and myself growing stronger these two years. I cherish spending time with my kid every day. I'm grateful to be alive. I believe both of us will embrace our lives even more whatever coming ups and downs in our roads. Life is not perfect. Life is beautiful. Thank you. Wow, beautiful presentation. Yeah. Uh, we thank uh, the uh, Angelica uh, uh, provide her, her story to us. Well, a lot, like I said, um, in uh, from our formal uh, data from our government, one in five women in Taiwan have been subject to physical or mental abuse at some stage in their life. Uh, Chinese uh, parental respectation is kind of particular cultural in the world, uh, especially in Asian society, because uh, after marriage, most women have to live where now most women have need to live with their mother or father-in-law. So they made a lot of strays from their uh, husbands or region families. So uh, Angelica's story is not only her story, but also it could be any others in Taiwan. We encourage women stand out and speak out when meet domestic violence. And we also encourage women share their experience, not just keep silence when meet domestic violence, no matter in our community, in our country, or in our world. There's still a lot of works we have to do in Taiwan. We hope we can to improve a better woman-friendly environment in Taiwan by advocating a lot of activities. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ching Wing. Thank you, Ching Wing, for your beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take questions and comments after the presentation, after the entire presentation. And now we'll take Daisy Chenwood, who is a great musician, um, to perform for us. Daisy, are you ready? Yes. Hello, Daisy. Okay. Hello. Please. Can you perform for us for your presentation? Thank you.
Good evening. I am Daisy Zhang. Thank you for having me to be here to share my story. This was a very complicated growing issue. About two years ago, our class had cheating, stealing behaviors occurred. However, their parents had strong powers to efface school species. It's unbelievable that we changed seven first to teachers as homework teachers in one semester. During that time, most parents began to consult those in a view at behavior. Some parents began bullying and it was the beginning of my nightmare. I was purposely excluded from a class growth up for musical graduation concerts by some parents because of parenting. Physical or cyber remorse about my parents. How notes belongs in parents' graves. Seen from that, my parents spent a lot of time helping me to communicate with other parents individually. School principal, teachers, and so on. It is said that it didn't work. My parents didn't give it up and continues to try to find that way out. Finally, after three months, I got help from my four classmates and their parents to help me get to change to be included in musical graduation concert. Although it's so to be being bullied. I went far from that joining its parents a bad from God. Both my parents and I don't want to see a repeat of smile things. Share my story in my 13th. I hope can help others like me when I grow up. So I really want to let you know. No one can be bullied and it's not always easy to recognize if it is happening to you. My parents find I was being bullied and told me no one deserves to be bullying, and I have that right to be safe. Bullying behaviors affect me. Some boys make net comments about me. I feel alone, and sometimes I saw at school. Some classmates spread untrue rumors, rumors about my parents and me. One of my boys' classmates called me. I was seen, sent to hospital emotions room my, by my mom and his parents. Parents didn't appall 
and refused to pay the medical bill. What appears when I was being bullied? God hate kids all that time. Not feel confidence anymore. Refuse to be in the public and practice music in fish commerce. Become angry as she. Become angry in its less. Right now, I help other when always also have the similar bullying issue with my in my school. Again, I want to advocate here. Anyone can be bullying, and it's not always easy to recognize if it is happening to you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Davy. Thank you for your beautiful channel performance, and thank you for sharing your story on your experience with bullying. Um, we apologize. The first speaker, Mrs. Abigail Simon Hart, the CEO of Recon Foundation, won't be joining us today. Um, however, the next video we have to watch is courtesy of the Recon Foundation Nigeria. Please listen. Thank you. The Recon Foundation has compiled this video to show the hidden dangers of a cancer diagnosis. I have breast cancer. Uh, when the cancer was diagnosed, I was so afraid to tell him. So, but where the issue started from was I didn't have the finance because I was out of job then and I wasn't married. So I had to cling to my mom because she was my I wouldn't say she's my best friend, but as at that time I didn't have anybody, she was all I had. My siblings were against me that is witchcraft. Yes, one told me that you're a witch, that's why you got cancer. You didn't marry, you lost your job, only you had all this. They fought me physically. It was not funny. He reacted so bad, not coming home, reject everything from me. So he was actually broadcasting it to his family, and they too, they were like, well, God has punished him. Yes, nobody has ever had this in our lineage and all that. The whole family just turned aside that what you are you are on death sentence and uh, sickness, so nobody is going to relate to you. So I would say they have come to realize that cancer is not a death sentence. People could also come to realize that it's not witchcraft. It can happen to anybody. And so he wasn't supportive at all. And because he didn't want people to talk. He was like, okay, you have to be praying, you have to be fasting, you have to be going to church and all that. The news was not palatable at first because I think he introduced me to go and meet so, natural herbs. So that's where the, the chorus started from because they bring some herbs in, goodbye, rejected, and it caused a lot of problems. Then I realized it's not worth it because my friends were like advising me that if of course God, God has our prayers but you still have to go medically. So when I went medically he was so hungry. He was so hungry that I went medically. So he threatened me that if I go I have to leave his house. Cancer is not something that can be cured with abs. It will only sub uh, it will only subdue the power of it financially and then my mom finally got part of the money she had been praying for and then even to the extent that when I was going for surgery I didn't have anybody to stay with me because it would be the future is is bright except God help those people are in that have cancer if people did not help us the family then I don't know it's only God that can help us um 
the future is very hopeful because I found out that strangers and friends stood by me. Even my family were not there, my husband was not there, but strangers, total strangers and friends stood in for me. So the future is kind of very, very encouraging. I want to talk to every young girl, every woman going through breast cancer. It's not a death sentence. You need to speak out. If I had not spoken up, I wouldn't have gotten the support I gave. And don't believe in whatsoever doctor tells you that you will soon die. Believe that if it is your time, then it is your time. Don't believe in evil reports. The problem shared is absolved. So um, breast cancer and all sorts of cancer is not a death sentence anymore. So the best is for you to speak out so that people will be helping. Thank you, Breakout Foundation, for sharing the experiences um, um, of many women, the financial burden and pain they've been through, and also trying to debunk the myths and mis misconceptions regarding the causes and treatments of cancer. So right now, we would um, entertain um, recommendations from the speakers, recommendations on how to end violence gender-based violence. We talked about orange in the pink space, we talked about different types of violence, the perpetrators of violence, and they affect the cancer patients. So now I would like us to talk about the recommendations of ways and how to end violence against women and girls. The floor is open. Hi everyone. I thank um, the moderator and all the speakers for a very elucidating um, session on gender-based violence, ending gender-based violence. At this juncture, the floor is open. Uh, like the moderator said, if you have any contributions or personal experience you wish to share with us, just tap on the hand uh, symbol on your screen and you can put on your microphone and speak. Thank you. Do we have any hand raised? I do not see any hand raised. Okay, so we can be entertaining questions and comments. Questions and answers. I should have something to ask the question. Can we entertain questions from the attendees? I am taking a look at the chat box and I don't seem to. Okay, uh, we have. Mm, Nyoma Benson, her hands are raised. Nyoma Benson is the president of BIFA Foundation USA. Nyoma, you have the floor. She's a legal practitioner practicing in the United States of America. We're glad to have you. Please, the floor is open for you. You can speak. Please put on your microphone and speak. No, please put on your microphone. Uh, 
No, you can unmute yourself and speak. Can you hear me? Hello. Madam moderator, uh, are you in charge of the microphone? No, ma. No, ma. Unmute yourself and speak. I don't know if she can hear us. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello, Norma, can you hear me? Barista Norma, can you unmute yourself and speak? Hello. It says permission to unmute was denied. Chingwe, please, can you check who is letting people in? Okay, good. Chingwe, please, can you unmute uh, Ne Benson? No, no, she has to turn on by herself. We can it control says, her. It says permission for microphone was denied. She just sent mm -hmm. me. Okay, and she says permission was denied. You have I don't know. I think she has issues of muting herself. Uh, Chinwe, is it possible to unmute uh, her from where you are? Or everybody has control over the microphones? Everybody does. Everybody does. So yes. probably a setting on her system. Now Google to assess your microphone. Okay, so while we're waiting for Barrister Norma Benson to, she's a legal practitioner and her NGO yes. Legal Foundation has worked tirelessly to support women in Nigeria and also in the US who are um, who have suffered from one form of violence or the other and they represent them in court for free so that's what Bifa foundation does my i first came in contact with Bifa foundation in the csw 63 that's mm -hmm. my first contact with Bifa foundation and they have been steadfast over the years representing mm -hmm. women for free who have had legal issues um, in nigeria and currently now i think the u.s branch is also doing something in that direction mm -hmm. so i'm hoping that she can unmute herself we really would have benefited from her wealth of knowledge but in the meantime i want to use the opportunity to appreciate daisy for um okay she's joined us again i appreciate daisy for hi yeah, hi barista Norma. you have the floor hi. I was just telling them about Bifo Foundation. I first met Bifo at CSW 63 in New right. York. And since then, they have been supporting the rights of women the world over, especially in Nigeria and currently in the US. Women who cannot represent themselves, who have legal issues in court. So the floor is open for you. We can't wait to benefit from your world of experience. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nchewe. Um, I'm really very excited to be here. I know that I just got this, <laughs> I just saw this invitation this morning. And um, I, I, I like um, the, way the, the way you likened um, violence against women and girls as a cancer, because that is actually what it is. And it is something that has been eaten deep into the society and every I, before we used to think that it was something you know just peculiar to africa but right now we see that it's something that is world over 
and um, it keeps deepening, especially in times of crisis. We saw a surge in violence against women and girls and other harmful practices, especially during the pandemic period where women were locked in at home because previously women kind of found an escape with work and so many places where they had to go out and do their businesses. They found it as an escape from various forms of violence that were perpetrated against them, especially in the home front. Um, but with the pandemic, when there was the lockdown, women had um, women were forced to be amongst abusers. And this is something that um, we need to keep talking about. This is something that we need to keep raising awareness about. It can we can never over say it or over over overthink it because this is something that is happening and it's worsening even as the days go by even with the war that is going on in in ukraine right now we see that people um military soldiers are raping and violating women and children and this is something that um the world needs to take a stand on as it is, I think um, more awareness is being raised, especially through the media and especially because of the work we're doing. And um, I need to commend um, the Pink Africa Foundation. You have gone all out. You have touched every area. Um, I think is is something very interesting, you know, likening and comparing, you know, cancer to violence against women and girls. And it's, it's worse, like you said, when women who are suffering from cancer are also going through abuse. And um, I just wanted to say that is I, I cannot overemphasize that it's a collective effort. It's something that behoves every one of us, you know, to stand against it, to speak against it, to advocate against it. And... Um, Presently, when I came to the United States and started working to um, relocate women who, because of the laws that we have in Africa, patriarchy and everything that um, we face in Africa, it makes it very difficult for us to legislate against um to bring practical interventions, really, because we know that Africa, most of the African countries already um, ratified the Maputo um, protocol, but yet we still have violence against women and girls perpetrated and nothing is being done. And so um, I came to the U.S. and started working to, you know, relocate and rehabilitate women fleeing from various forms of violence and abuse in from Africa. And so far, it's it's been a challenge as well. So I just I just want to thank you for bringing it up to this level of United Nations and for us to need to speak about it. Um, recently, I was appointed the chairperson for um, United Nations and European Union and African Union Spotlight Initiative Civil Society Regional Reference Group. And we are working and I just wanted to use this opportunity, you know, to be able to Every we can continue to have these conversations on this higher level and continue to work together to eliminate violence against women and girls. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you very much, Barista Benson. It's very, uh, we are so happy to have you. Thank you for dropping by and congratulations on your recent appointment. We will work with Spotlight Initiative just give us the green light, we'll be there and we'll give you all the support we can from here. Uh, incidentally, our moderator is also Dr. Benson, so feel free to reach out to her. <laughs> Thank you very much, Benson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So do we have any other hand raised? Would entertain comments and questions from the floor. In the absence of uh, okay. any other questions, I don't know if we can talk a little bit about bullying amongst children. 
it's a it's a that's where the violence starts i must commend daisy for speaking out i think the floor is open Everybody, anybody can talk at the moment how do we combat bullying amongst children my daughter went for a birthday party and she was bullied recently i struggled with how to handle it i virtually struggled with it and i thank god i was around because the big brother went downstairs wanted to engage in the fight how dare you bully my sister in my presence but we have to you know as parents know how to handle bullying because when you get it wrong that first time it sows a seed in the child that takes the child through life and i think that bullying is the origin of this gen it's one of the origins of gender-based violence because it begins from the home yes exactly what do you, what do you say right yeah. Yes, um, I, I want to share because in Taiwan, those people, when they meet bullying, not only uh, for uh, in the campus or even in the workplace, uh, most of us just choose to be silent, yeah. to keep silent. So it's so weird because when, like I encourage Angelica, uh, uh, who a survivor, a cancer survivor, uh, me, uh, me has the uh, marriage problem, but I encourage her probably more than five times, but she she think oh uh, she will feel embarrassed even she just speak it out or just write in the words. It just, she just feels so shame. It's so weird because uh, it's it really difficult to take the first step to break the cycle of abuse. That's my sharing. Yeah. Barrister Benson, what do you say about bullying? How do we help the children? Right, right. I was going to say, I think it's the same thing everywhere. Like I know that, in fact, it got, um, when my kids um, moved to the US, um, the first time they moved here, my son was at the receiving end. I know that there was a time he had to call me and he put his phone on speaker and I heard him saying, my mom is a lawyer. She's going to deal with you. And he was crying. And I felt really sorry for him. <laughs> and I felt really sorry for him, but really it's not funny because, you know, sometimes you find out that the children who perpetrate this are people from very dysfunctional homes yeah. Yeah. and they are children who have actually not give, been they've not been given that much care and love from the home front and that's the reason they come out and they try to take it out from on other kids and first of all um besides the fact that we have to always make sure that we don't keep quiet about it inform um if this is happening in school for instance I think the first step is to make sure that the school authorities are alerted. And sometimes we know that um, some schools are very afraid of some parents mm -hmm. and um, they try to play down on these issues. But I think it's our duty as parents to make sure that, I think that's also the reason why they have the Parents Teachers Association. So when you alert the school, that's the first step and you think that this is being played down on, then it's also your duty as a parent to inform the Parent Teachers Association so that he takes it a step further. Um, in my case, like in my son's case, when I alerted the school authority, they did call the parents of the kid. And by the time the parents of the kid came, it was just obvious to see where the problem was coming from. Mm -hmm. And you would see how how their, their behavior was just too obnoxious like you would just know that okay this is this is the origin of the problem with this child and when you find that out another thing at that point is to make sure that the parents teachers association are involved because if that if that is played down we don't just take a sorry no the child has that in them in their mind. Like it keeps working on them, like um, like Dr. Chewe said, it's going to have a lasting effect on them how you handle it. 
So when you take it that step further to inform, inform the Parents Teachers Association, we make it a topic. We try to create spaces where these children, they have, I think every school, I think they do have guidance and counseling in schools. So I mm -hmm. think it's important to recommend these children to see you insist and say, no, sorry, I, I, I accept your sorry, but I'm more comfortable if I hear that this child is getting counseling. I mean, the mm -hmm. child that is bullying, this child mm -hmm. is getting counseling because that child needs to be, needs to unlearn certain things that are making the child to be that kind of person. Because that is actually true, it's the origin. That is where most of these things come from because a lot of children, the mental health of children are being downplayed. Mm. And when they start from that cradle to behave this way, it is very difficult for them to stop when they become adults. But mm. if the mental health of children are prioritized from school, a child who is shown love, even if the child is not receiving that love and care from the home front, and you come to school and you prioritize the child's mental health and the child is receiving love and care and attention and therapy, believe me, the child will go back home to be a light to that family. So okay. it's important that we insist that the, the, that the school that our kids go to, especially in the, on the PTA level, we insist that the mental health of children are checked. Let the mm. guidance and counseling people who are receiving salary do their job. Let them give, let them cancel these kids. Let them talk to the kids. Let them be able to meet one-on-one. -on -one. I remember like in my son's case, the child that bullied him, one of the parents came, the other parent didn't come because the other parent, parent was in jail at the time. So that's to let you know where that child is coming from. So, but when we insisted that this child actually needs help, I know that after some time, like, the next birthday for my kids the child was invited and he came and he's been friends to my kids like casual friends since then so it's important that we know that the child who is bullying another mm -hmm. child needs help it's also important to let our kids know that the people who are doing this to you are not normal this is not mm -hmm. a normal behavior this is not how anyone should be so you shouldn't even join issues with them what you should understand is that whatever they are doing should be the authorities should be alerted immediately because what they are doing is not right don't keep quiet about it don't say oh they are going to call me a snitch or anything no you're actually trying thank to you, hurt them when you report their behavior thank you thank you so much Barrington Benson thank you so much for your contribution thank you um we've come to the end of today's session and I would like to emphasize that gender-based violence is a violation against human rights, and therefore there should be zero, zero tolerance for uh, gender-based violence. And that's the only solution, zero tolerance for gender-based violence. So to eliminate gender-based violence, each and every one of us should take a stand. We shouldn't give up, we shouldn't stop it, we should take a stand. I would like to thank all our speakers, and um, uh, Daisy, the performer, I'd like to thank all, also, also thank all the attendees for participating in this meeting. But before we end the meeting, I would like us all, us all to turn on our cameras and um, do the break the break the bias sign for a good picture. Thank you very much. So can we all turn on all our cameras for a good picture? To do the break the bias sign. Yes. Can we do the break the bias sign. Can we all turn on our camera? Hey. Who is taking the picture? I will take the picture. Okay. Oh my god. Who is taking the picture? Okay. I am because I can't do both. Is there somebody else who can help us? Victor, can you take the picture for us? I'm picking the first one. Second. Okay. Please turn on your camera. I'm not seeing everybody. Oh.
Okay, can somebody else take so that I can be part of the picture? <laughs> So we'll say one to go break the bias and gender based violence. One to go break the bias and gender violence. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.